And um, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. It's um, Dr. Alex Menes. Alex is a, a biologist. In his undergraduate research, was on the ecology of subtidal marine mollusks in Gibraltar. He then went on to do his PhD on the ecology of land mollusks in southern Iberia, focusing on biogeography, habitat structures, effect on diversity. Alex is an associate researcher of the Institute of Life and Earth Sciences here at the University of Gibraltar and an honorary fellow of the Gibraltar Museum. He is currently researching the history of natural history in Gibraltar, including paleoanthropology, and has recently published several papers on the history of the Gibraltar skull and the Gibraltar Scientific Society. So I look forward to, um, we, we look forward to hearing your talk, Alex, on almost Homo calpicus, an updated historiography of the Gibraltar skull. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, you'll notice I'm not going to be walking around. I prefer to be um, stationary here, uh, using the least energy possible. So I'm going to be talking about the Gibraltar skull on the 170th anniversary of the presentation of the skull to the Gibraltar Scientific Society. Look at the current historiography and an updated historiography. And I'm going to ask the question, what would have happened if the skull had arrived in England prior to 1864. We'll be looking at, for example, the area in the mid-1860s, which was seminal and critical for the um, development of the field of paleoanthropology as we know it today. So this is the lady I'm going to be talking about uh, this afternoon, the Gibraltar skull, Gibraltar 1, or the Forbes Quarry skull. And I like to think of the Gibraltar skull, as with any other fossil, as it not just being a specimen, um, but also being a vehicle through time. So we can use specimens to connect to the past, look at the future, and understand the present. Um, so it provides all sort of information. It provides information regarding its anatomical um, proportions and so on. We've already seen, for example, that it's continuing to provide information despite the many, many decades that have passed since it was taken to, to England. We've seen that it's um, taken part in what has been described as the ancient DNA revolution. And I must confess that when I saw that little pile of powder next to it, I had a little bit of a... Uh, <laughs> earlier, although I understand the need to do a certain invasive uh, sampling of specimens... But nonetheless, after having researched this particular specimen for a number of years, there was a little bit of a disconnect, disconnection for me there. But anyway, so let's have a look. So for many years, the Gibraltar skull was thought to be the very first Neanderthal specimen that had been found. Now, we know... Now, we've known since um, 1936, since Frere Point described the Engis child skull, Engis II, as an Neanderthal fossil, that in fact the Gibraltar skull was the second um, Neanderthal specimen found, but the most complete of the skulls, the first of the most complete skulls. I'm sticking to my notes here because I'm following the same as in uh, laboratory work in the ancient DNA and following a protocol here given to me by my wife after my last talk that she said, slow down, keep, keep topics short but interesting and not so many dates. <laughs> so I'm keeping to that, so, <laughs> which is why I've got some notes. So uh, let's have a look. So the next one. Unlike the vast majority of skulls, especially the ones that are very well known within the field of paleoanthropology because they've been seminal to the development of that field, we know almost nothing at all about the discovery of the Gibraltar skull and very little about its history. So this is one of the things that I'm going to be... Well, the main aim that I'm going to be doing today, looking at today. So first of all, I'm going to take a look at the current historiography of the Gibraltar skull and see how we can build up a little bit on that and make it slightly more accurate. So essentially what we have now and what's described in most of the literature is that it was found in Forbes Quarry, which we, know, which we know is almost certainly true, but it was either found by Lieutenant Flint, 
a quarry worker or somebody else given to Flint, and it was then presented to the Gibraltar Scientific Society. Now, the current historiography, wherever you read, says that, unfortunately, the people in the Gibraltar Scientific Society weren't necessarily up to speed on issues related to paleoanthropology, which, we can, which we're going to look at later, and I'm going to uh, provide some information as to uh, uh, why that was. But if we look there, I mean, I've just taken a few examples from the literature as to what, what is said, has been said, and continues to be said about the Skull and the Gibraltar Scientific Society's um, impact on it. So, for example, we have shortly after presentation, it was, it was put on a shelf or in a cabinet to collect dust. A um, Gibraltar Scientific Society were a small scientific society, a community stranded on a rock. And we'll see how that um, is not necessarily the correct way of looking at what they were doing. And it continues, if, for example, we'll see there that, uh, another two quotes from many, uh, parties of a heavy-browed race, which we call Neanderthal man, came to the rock, where at least one woman died, leaving a skull which was discovered at Forbes Quarry. The Gibraltar Scientific Society met to discuss this and then put it away in a cupboard. So we get this, we get this continual um, uh, narrative. And then, this is a particularly interesting one, uh, when a similar skull was unearthed in Germany eight years later, which is the Neanderthal one find, it was widely publicised as belonging to the earliest man then known, called Neanderthal man. And the Gibraltar Scientific Society claimed they had it, they had a similar skull, so Neanderthal man should have been Gibraltar woman. Now, that highlights the, the disjunct narrative that's commonly used because Neanderthal one was discovered in 1856. And in 1853, the Gibraltar Society was uh, uh, in demise and became extinct. So the Gibraltar Society didn't exist at that time. This is one example. So let's have a look. And then what I'm also going to look at is another um, part of the historiography at the moment, which is that there was a, an element of a race to name a new species of man. Was it uh, Neanderthal one? Should Neanderthal one be the first Neanderthal that had been named? Was it a situation, was it a case where Gibraltar 1 didn't make it in time, as it were, to, to London and it would have been Gibraltar woman instead of Neanderthal man? And we'll see also that that is, is not entirely accurate. So where can we get information that may help us to essentially update, I don't like to use the word rewrite, but update the historiography, make it more accurate? Well, we need to look at, for example... Um, primary uh, archival documents, materials, letters and so on and, and uh, critically the minutes of the Gibraltar Scientific Society which exist from the formation of the society all the way until its demise and where we'll find the only known reference to the Gibraltar skull until it arrives in, in England in 1864. So those 12 words in the minute written in the minutes of the 3rd of January, sorry, 3rd of March, 1848, is the only record we have at all of the Gibraltar skull. And it's, you'll be able to read it, but I'll, I'll read it quickly. It says, presented a human skull from Forbes Quarry, North Front, by the secretary. The secretary was Lieutenant Flint. So, from there we know that it was found at Forbes Quarry, which... Those are photographs of Forbes Quarry as it exists today. If we look back at um, earlier depictions of Forbes Quarry, the one on your left is an ink drawing by Winfred Duckworth, who executed that um, diagram when he was in Gibraltar in 1910, looking at different caves, but with a principal aim of looking at more details related to the Gibraltar One skull discovery as part of a project that involves a whole range of people, including Sir Arthur Keith from the uh, Royal College of Surgeons and other people, during a period in paleoanthropology when there was a resurgence in the interest in the Neanderthal uh, finds and indeed other finds. So, of interest there is, I think you can just about see it, and this is going to be my only non-sedentary uh, movement during the 
backwards um, diagram is a cave. And that cave, cave is of interest because the surgeon and amateur uh, anthropologist who was in Gibraltar at the time, Samuel William Turner, went to look at Forbes Quarry for information, for, as an information gathering uh, exercise to pass on material to the people that were in the Royal College of Surgeons, as I've mentioned already, Arthur Keith, but also uh, Sir Tweedy, who was interested in the history of the skull. Because he saw that cave there, he, he uh, posited the possibility that the skull may have come from that cave. Now, after that, Arthur Keith then basically put two and two together and perhaps came out with 4.5. And what he saw was the possibility that that cave there, which he hadn't visited and which Turner hadn't provided diagrams for or, or um, detailed descriptions of, to be similar to a cave that had been found less than a decade earlier at Monkey's Quarry and was a terrace-type cave, as you can see on the top there. At the bottom is Keith's, is Keith's rendition of, of the diagram there at the top. And Keith then propagated this in the literature beginning with 1911 and 1950, his 1911 and 1915 works, Ancient Man and um, Antiquity of Man. So that became the narrative that the, the skull was found in a cave in, in Forbes Quarry, for which there's no definitive evidence. But when we look at Forbes Quarry from a more contemporaneous um, perspective, we can see at the top there a photograph from... 1853. You can see the, the talus on the right hand side. It's got the old umbrella there. Here, the talus here extends quite a way to the right hand side and actually abuts onto Forbes Quarry. And one of the best uh, places to see it is actually the very accurate museum model of Gibraltar from 1863 1864 where you can see circled in the middle one is the position of Forbes Quarry. At the bottom is a close-up position, and you'll see that the entire, uh, or even there we'd, we'd already lost some of the talus and, and material, but the entirety of what is now empty space, as it were, was actually uh, talus. So this will link later to where I show that um, the skull probably came from a sea-level beach fossilised beach at um, Forbes and not the cave. But for now, I want to go back to the Gibraltar Scientific Society and talk a little bit about that, just to essentially write, I think, a little bit of the bad press that they've had for so long in, in, the, in the narrative. And, and the reason for this is because when I started looking at the, Gibraltar, the history of the Gibraltar skull, I thought to myself, well, yeah, again, you know, why didn't the... Gibraltar Scientific Society do a little bit more at the time and so on and so forth but then all the pieces fall together uh, to explain why, why they didn't so this society was set up in 1835 to promote the study of science and um, most of its members were officers and professionals and so on in Gibraltar and taking into account the fact that the society was formed in 1835 actually shows that it was at the, at the same period and had the same interests, which I will uh, mention in a while, as a lot of the leading societies in Britain at the time. For example, the British Association for the Advancement of Science was set up just three years before. The, and here I'm giving dates that I'm not going to give too many. As, astronomical Society was 1820, Zoological 1826, and Botanical 1836. So this was a society that was put together in one of the colonies, one of the British colonies, by people that were interested in science. And the person who, who, who set it up, uh, Dr. Burroughs, was actually uh, somebody who had great interests in science. He'd written several books, a fellow of Royal Society. Um, he'd written books on conchology. He'd written books on, on other aspects of science. A book that he illustrated himself about the Elgin marble. So there are all sorts of... Uh, and there were other people in that society, not just local, but people from outside who were members... That's James Smith of Jordan Hill, a geologist. He wrote the, the second uh, geology of, of, geological account of Gibraltar, 
1846. The first one was by Imri in, the, in, 18, in 1786. And he was a leading geologist in, in Britain at the time. He was influential in the way people looked at all sorts of aspects related to, for example, uh, coastal change, coastal erosion. So we're talking about people here who were influential in their fields in Britain and were honorary members here. And it's not just that there were honorary members, as we might think of today, that have a subscription and, and there you go. No. I mean, these people were coming to Gibraltar. So uh, James Smith of Jordan Hill lived in Gibraltar for a short period. He lived in Portugal. As was common at the time, people that were a little bit affluent could escape the British uh, climate and uh, come to the continent. And he did that and uh, geologized whilst he was in Europe. He presented several talks to the Gibraltar Scientific Society. And interestingly, his manuscript for his Geology of Gibraltar is almost exactly the recorded talk that he gave to the Gibraltar Scientific Society just a year before it was published. Another example, I'm only going to give a couple, I'm not going to give too many, is Robert Brown. Um, again, very influential scientist of the time, vice president of the Linnaean Society. He was a botanist and microscopist who discovered Brown in motion, after which it's, 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 it's named after him. He gave lectures to the Gibraltar Scientific Society. And the Gibraltar Scientific Society wasn't just a small uh, colony, uh, a small society that was clinging onto a rock in, in, in the British colony. It became part of a network that stretched well beyond Gibraltar to Britain, South Africa, and many other places, and was one of the first uh, colonies, one of the first places where and there was an uptake by one of the... Um, one of the research projects that had been put together by this person, who um, people will recognize as Herschel, William Herschel, who was a, an astronomer, and he proposed to put together a global network, to set up a global network so that people could take the same type of measurements, astronomical measurements, and come together and then look at those results. And the Gibraltar Scientific Society took part in that. So all these projects that it was taking part in and, and its influence outside Gibraltar was recognised. So we, again, I'm just going to give you two examples. Uh, one of them reads, an association has recently been established at Gibraltar, bearing the title of the Gibraltar Scientific Society, of which Dr. Barrow is president with a competent council. And then another one, remember we, we're looking now at the colonial period, so uh, it's truly gratifying to see that activity in scientific pursuits is far spreading from Britain to her colonies. And Gibraltar was instrumental in doing, doing a lot of this. But then we come to 1853, and that is the last entry in the minute book of the Gibraltar Scientific Society. Is that how many minutes I've got left or how many I've done? How many I've got left? Okay, so nobody really knows why the society um, came to an end. An analysis of the minute book in association with the Garrison Library minute books seems to show that there were several, several fe uh, factors that um, brought this about. One was the fact that the Gibraltar Scientific Society formed a union with a library and its museum passed over to the, to the uh, library. Garrison Library looked after the museum. At the same time, it seemed that funds were lessening, were, 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 there were less funds coming into the society, and the third factor probably accounting for the uh, extinction of the society was that Barrow at that time was feeling uh, a little bit less than 100%, and he ended up moving back to Britain. So all those factors probably just... just uh, coalesce into the perfect storm, as it were, and, and the society ceased to be. What happened after that? To the, to now we're going to look at the collection of the society, which would have included the Gibraltar skull. So, the society, as I've said, had its collection in the Garrison Library, not the Garrison Library building itself, possibly, but in an outhouse, which was built had been built very recently after the society um, 
had been running for about 10 or 15 years. Now, what we don't know is exactly what happened to the collection. From the literature, we know that it went to, for a period, to the soldier's home. Soldier's home was set up in Gibraltar by uh, Pilkington, who then expanded his model of setting up these homes for non-commissioned officers in order that they might have some activities that weren't just related to drinking and all sorts of things that uh, non-commissioned officers used to do at the time. I've not taken any quotes, but some of the, some of the reports... Yeah, some of the reports at the time are quite, um, uh, are quite detailed as to what sorts of things that non-commissioned officers used to get up to. So this model was then taken outside Gibraltar and is the progenitor of what happened at Aldershot, the model that was set up in Aldershot at the time that was, that was then uh, rolled out to all the British Army everywhere else, including other colonies. So it went to the, to the uh, soldiers' home, but that declined as well. So in 18, by 1863, we lose track exactly of what happened to the collections. Almost certainly, they were still in the um, soldiers' home. There's a contemporaneous account by uh, Lieutenant Alexander Burton Brown, who was a geologist, wrote several papers about the geology of Gibraltar. One of the most important ones that could have cleared some of the issues related to where the skull may or may not have been found, unfortunately, wasn't published in a geological journal, but was published in a military journal. So it's escaped the attention of historians uh, for, for many, many, many years. So we know from his account that that fossil there, which is a fossil of Elephas Antiquus, that was collected by James Smith of Jordan Hill, previously to Burton Brown having, having rummaged through the collection or what was left of the collection in the soldier's home and reported in Smith's uh, paper as I described earlier, the Geology of Gibraltar, 1846. And you, you can see the, the labels on there that uh, signifies where that uh, uh, fossil was described originally. And I rediscovered that fossil when I was looking through the broom material in the Natural History Museum. Uh, its location had been lost for 130 odd years and there it was at the back of a drawer. But the important thing about it, that particular fossil is, is twofold. One is that there could well be other fossils that are in collections that haven't been looked at or worked at the level at which um, perhaps they need to be looked at. And let me tell you, the, the broom collection is very, very extensive. There's a huge amount of material there. A lot of it has been published, a lot of it was published by Busk and others and Falconer in works related to Gibraltar Pleistocene material, but there's still a lot of material left to, to look at. And um, the other fact that's interesting about it is that it's only the second known specimen from the collection of the Gibraltar Scientific Society that's in exist, that we know exists. The other one is the Gibraltar skull. There may be other specimens, but uh, we're not 100% sure exactly whether there may be some more in the Broom collection or perhaps the Gibraltar Museum. I don't think hold any. Uh, uh, I know Clyde's looked in the past. But uh, anyway, so those are the only two specimens. And talking about Broom, uh, Frederick Broom was governor of the military prison in Gibraltar, and he's seminal to the narrative of the history of the Gibraltar skull because, we'll, as we'll see as the t talk progresses, he was um, critical to the Gibraltar skull having been sent over to England in 1864. He was a very interested amateur archaeologist in Gibraltar and he excavated the Genista Caves, which um, some of you may have, may have heard about, the first one that was discovered was as a result of excavations that were taking place for a tank in the uh, military prison. Excavations began on the 12th of November, 1862, and as soon as it was noticed that there were certain uh, interesting finds during the, during the course of those excavations for the tank, i.e. bones and, and pottery, Broom was able to 
uh, have the excavations stalled for a short period of time whilst material was collected. Now that is, that image there is the only known image of Frederick Broom and the, reason, the only reason I have it is because uh, Stuart Finlayson and um, Tyson Holmes were able to contact the family and over time they were able to provide that, that photograph. That's the only known photograph of him. And I've, uh, I'm showing it with permission and it will be in, in the book with permission. So it's not that I've cribbed it off Stuart and, and, uh, and uh, Tyson. So he was then collecting huge amounts of material. A lot of material was coming out of the Genista Caves. He was very interested in the materials, but he recognized his limitations, which was very interesting because at the time, even people that were professional archaeologists would be collecting huge amounts of material and distributing them, them across uh, all of Europe. Even, for example, people like Christy Latte and other people that were working in, in uh, South Western France, a lot of material went to, not just to museums, but also to private collectors. We're lucky because most of the Denisa material went straight to, to people who were very knowledgeable about uh, Pleistocene materials, and those people were, again, central to our story, George Busk and Hugh Falconer. Hugh Falconer had published substantially on um, faunas in India. He'd been uh, stationed in India for many years. George Busk, anatomist, um, surgeon, paleontologist, had worked very, very widely um, on faunas. These two people received a huge amount of material. It was sent to the Royal College of Surgeons, and they were working on the material actively. This is just um, a very small, a very small um, selection of material. And some of it was published. So you can see this one here, for example. Most of those are, are in um, Busk's monograph of the Genista material but there is a huge amount of material still to look at. But it wasn't just, it wasn't just um, this type of material. There were also human remains. So a fair amount of uh, human skeletal remains came from Genista. These are Neolithic material. Some of them were taken to the Natural History Museum. Some of them were in the Royal College of Surgeons. On the right-hand side is an image from Busk's notebook and his um, original album and prints of the skulls. So from there, we then need to link up as to exactly why the Gibraltar skull ended up in Gibraltar. Remember, up at, uh, in, in England, sorry. Remember that up until this time, with Broom sending material to Busk and Falconer, no one in, in England knows about the Gibraltar skull. It's not that uh, uh, people know it's there, they want it sent over, no. So the reason that the skull went, went to, to uh, England was as a result of these two people. The person on the left is uh, Moses Montefiore, who was a philanthropist and president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews. And he was a humanitarian, vastly wealthy his uh, sister-in-law was married to Rothschild. Uh, he, for a number of years, worked the stock exchange, retired at 40. Um, and wherever there was a problem related to anything to do with um, uh, Jewish issues, or not just Jewish issues, other issues, wherever people were persecuted, he would uh, go visit and uh, try and resolve and help. He had huge influence with people across Europe, uh, so he was uh, known to royalty, high society, ministers, so he, was, he had a lot of influence, in other words. So he received a letter from the Jewish community in Gibraltar saying that there were was, there was some issues with the community of Jews living in Tangier, and, and there, was, there was a huge community of Jews living in Tangier. So off he went. He left, he went to, they went to... Um, to Gibraltar, and you can see there they, they, they visited the Garrison Library. Now, the other person that we've just seen was Thomas Hodgkin, who people will know 
as uh, probably from his, his medical side more than from his anthropological side, after which uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma is, is named. He was Montefiore's personal physician, and he promised Moses' wife on her deathbed that he would always continue going with Moses all over the place wherever he visited, and they had been visiting places for decades before that. So along went uh, uh, Thomas Hodgkin, and this is the critical juncture in the history of the Gibraltar skull that explains why the Gibraltar skull ended up going to England. So whilst there, whilst in Britain, and as we can see there, um, we have Montefiore, we have um, Hodgkin, and two other people who were, who were uh, Montefiore's friends. I won't go into details. They arrive in Gibraltar, and Hodgkin meets Broom. Now, when Hodgkin met uh, Broom, he didn't know about the Gibraltar skull. Hodgkin, I mean. He, he, didn't, he didn't go to meet Broom so that he could find out about the Gibraltar skull and so on. He went there because he wanted to look at the caves. And Thomas Hodgkin had been an anthropologist and ethnologist for at least 30 years prior to his visit to Gibraltar. He'd formed the um, Aboriginal Society. He was a, he'd published numerous papers on anthropology, numerous papers on ethnology. So when he saw the skull, he recognized that it was slightly unusual. This is recounted only by Busk in his um, first publication of the Gibraltar skull, which is this one, once it gets to, to Britain. Now, this was published in a periodical called The Reader, and we may think, well, it's like a newspaper, but The Reader at the time was a very influential publication that covered all sorts of subjects related to science, uh, literature, arts, and so on. It wasn't a scientific publication per se, but it put the, the, um, the issue of the Gibraltar skull into the public and scientific domain. So what we have then is that Hodgkin sees the skull. Broom had been sending all sorts of material over to Britain. He included the skull in one of those consignments. It wasn't straight away, which, which led me to think that perhaps Broom wanted to hang on to it. I think Broom knew its value because after the dissemination of a lot of the um, material from the Gibraltar Scientific Society, some of it was uh, possibly kept by Broom, who had a collection of material himself from Janista. So, Hodgkin saw the, the skull in December 1863, but the skull didn't go to Britain straight away. Other consignments of Janista material did, but the skull didn't get to Britain until July 1864. Now, one of the first people to see it was Charles Darwin, who was Busk, Falconers, and Charles Lyell's friend. All of these people had, had seen the skull. Uh, Thomas Huxley had seen the skull. Charles Darwin saw the skull. And in the only known reference to the Gibraltar skull by Charles Darwin... He mentions to his friend Hooker in a letter that Falcon had brought him the Gibraltar skull. He, named, he called it the wonderful Gibraltar skull. And if we had time, which we don't, I would in detail um, spell out exactly why it is that Darwin didn't make any more of the Neanderthal finds, neither the Gibraltar skull nor Neanderthal one. But we haven't got time. That's another, for another, another time. It's a very interesting uh, um, narrative in itself. So... After this, remember this was, we don't know exactly when Darwin saw the skull. We know that it was in August of 1863, but we don't, in 1864, but we don't know the exact date because Darwin said in his letter that he'd seen it in the, in the week prior whilst he was staying with his sister-in-law in Chester Place in London, but he doesn't give the exact date. And of particular interest to, to the narrative as well is this, is this cartoon drawn by uh, Thomas Henry Huxley. And I won't go into much detail about the text which has been, which has been translated by some eminent Latin scholars that I've, I've recruited. And Nobby, who's sitting there, was, uh, uh, organized a local con Latin contingent. But it's also gone to people in Kent and the... 
Translation highlights some interesting features about what Huxley was thinking about at the time, but I'm not going to go into it today. You'd have to wait till the book comes out. No, don't you? <laughs> PR, PR. Right, so, but what is interesting there is that although it's only a cartoon, if you look at the date, 19th of July, 1864, it's actually the first ever reconstruction of what Gibraltar 1 looks like. It's written, it's, it was drawn in jest, and it's not what, um, it's not what uh, Huxley thought Neanderthals looked like. And let's remember that at this time, although that's Gibraltar 1, it was already a period when Thomas Huxley, uh, Basque, Falconer, the people that were working in paleoanthropology that had already seen Neanderthal 1, had already said that Gibraltar 1 was very, very similar to Neanderthal 1, which by extension means that they, they thought it was the same, the same species. So let's continue. From there, we see that, again in the reader, Busk states there that the, the Gibraltar skull was very similar to the Neanderthal cranium. And what's really interesting here for the narrative is that as recognised by Busk, it was a much more complete specimen. It enabled people to see what the face was like, which the Neanderthal one cranium obviously didn't. And there was a lot of speculation at the time. Again, we almost certainly haven't got time to go into it. To the, the, the details, there was a lot of to and fro in as to whether or not Neanderthal one was a pathological specimen uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Gibraltar one helped understand the Neanderthal one fossil, so it played a very critical part in the early period in the 1860s when the field of paleoanthropology was being put together, as it were. So from there, we then have the Gibraltar skull almost certainly going to the British Association for the Advancement of Science meeting in Bath. I say almost certainly because it's not 100% certain that Busk actually took it there. It's not documented. What is certain is that uh, Busk and Falconer were to deliver two papers at that um, conference. Busk was going to deliver that paper, which was on the... Gibraltar skull, which constitutes the first mention in any type of scientific publication. And Falconer was going to deliver a paper, but unfortunately for history, only because we don't have a detailed account of the discussions after the paper, unfortunately the meeting was delayed as a result of eight extra papers that were put into the uh, discussions. So both the men left before the end of the um, meeting. By meeting, I don't mean the meeting of the day, I mean the entire meeting, the Bass meeting. And they were on their way to Gibraltar on the PNO Puna there. And when they arrived in Gibraltar, they went to see their main reason for coming to Gibraltar was to look at the Genista case, but also, also to try and determine exactly where in Gibraltar the Gibraltar one skull had come from. And this is the paper I referred to earlier and I said had been missed by historians. That is the only reference we have, contemporaneous reference we have anywhere, of where the skull may have come from. And that's Alexander, Alexander Burton Brown, who went with Busk and Falconer to Forbes Quarry and saw deposits there that no longer exist, haven't existed there for decades and decades, and where they thought that the matrix that was on the skull matched the matrix on one of the uh, sea levels there, uh, uh, beach levels. So that's the closest we'll ever get to where the skull may have come from. Certainly not the cave, I, I would suggest. Um, after that, not very much happens in the literature as regards uh, recording what happened to the skull from 1864 onwards. Busk almost certainly kept it because there would have been other material in the Royal College of Surgeons that he was working on, so it would have gone there. He took it almost certainly, but again, it's not 100% because it's not uh, documented in the primary literature, to the 1868 International Congress of Prehistoric Archaeology. Again, a juncture that's important for the narrative of the history of the Gibraltar skull because whilst there, 
at a discussion of Busk's paper, which was about the material from the Gibraltar caves, Paul Broca and other leading uh, paleoanthropologists were there, and the, the discussion moved on to the Gibraltar skull. Now, Busk sent uh, photographs to Broca, and he then produced what, was, what constitutes the very first published scientific paper of any detail on the Gibraltar skull. He describes the skull, gives the measurements, so on and so forth. Um, remember, I've said all these people that have looked at the, the Gibraltar skull. I've said Broca, who's a leading paleontologist, uh, Huxley, Basque, Falconer. Notice that not one of them has said, look, let's describe it as a new species up to now. So then after that, we lose, um, we lose uh, records of what happened to the skull. It goes to the Royal College of Surgeons. You'll notice there that it it was um, presented to the Royal College of Surgeons by Busk. It stays in the Royal College of Surgeons. There's a resurgence in paleoanthropological interest beginning in the late 1890s all the way through to the early 20th century with new finds. So we have Sitka, Spy 1, Spy 2, Crepina, Lemustia, so on and so forth, Lakina. And that's where Sir Arthur Keith comes in. Now, Sir Arthur Keith if you remember, was the person who thought that the skull had possibly been found in, in, in a cave in the quarry. Now, critically to the narrative of the Gibraltar skull, he publishes a letter in Nature in 1911 that he had received from one, uh, Busk's daughters. That letter there was, is, is not from 1911. That letter there was written by Falconer in 1864, the 27th of August, 1864, which was at the time that, round about the time that Huxley had drawn the cartoon, round about the time that Darwin saw the skull. So there's, there's this juncture there. Now, I would argue very strongly that what Falconer wrote there was mostly written in jest. I'm, I'm not going to read it all out, but if you, if you read it yourselves and, or, a very, or just skim it, you can see that that doesn't constitute a plan of any sort to uh, get heads together and put together a name and call the Gibraltar skull uh, Homo calpicus. It's based, there's a lot of background to that, and that last bit at the bottom about French light is actually hitting at some of the uh, French paleoanthropologists at the time. There's a lot of rivalry between the, the English and French paleoanthropologists. So, but that then stays from the early 20th century onwards, the almost Homo calpicus myth is born and continues after that period. But Neanderthal one had already been named. So William King in 1863 at the British uh, Association meeting in Norwich discussed the uh, Neanderthal remains described it as a new species at the meeting. Obviously, that didn't take on um, a scientific uh, validity until it was formally published the following year. But even before those transactions were published, in January of 1864, in that brand new journal, in the very first edition of that journal, is where he published his, most, his more substantial paper on Neanderthal one describing it. And by this stage, thinking that it wasn't just um, specifically uh, different to Homo sapiens, but actually generically, although he didn't raise a, a new genus for it, but as you can see there, he thought that it was actually so aberrant, so different, that he would, he would uh, he consider, he considered it being in a different genus. Now, again, um, if there was more time, and I may have time to get onto it, why, why was it that William King described Neanderthal I and no one else did? We'll, we'll have a quick look if we've got time. I think we have. So to go back to the Neanderthal remains quickly, that on the right-hand side is the Neanderthal cave before it was all destroyed for, uh, by quarrying, a little bit like Forbes Quarry, unfortunately. On the left is the Neander Valley. That's contemporaneous and slightly, uh, slightly before the findings. Those are the Neanderthal one findings. There would have been more, almost certainly, if the workers had have 
perhaps being slightly more careful, they didn't know they were human bones, and some of the bones were lost. And interestingly, many, many years later, some were found at the spoil below the uh, grotto, as most people know, work by Schmidt and, and others, which led on to some excavations in our own fourth quarry, trying to find, which we didn't. But anyway, so Hermann um, Schalfhausen describes the Neanderthal remains, Interestingly, again, to the narrative, the almost, uh, uh, almost Homo calpicus narrative, he doesn't describe it as a new species. He sees it as an aberrant form. So what can we say about uh, uh, people describing why it wasn't described as a new species, why uh, the Gibraltar one wasn't described as a new species, and so on? Let's look first at the news of... Neanderthal one coming to Britain. Remember that at the time, very few people were conversant in German in Britain. I mean, it wasn't a language that, although it was a, we can consider it to be, at that time, a scientific language, not many people were conversant in German. Huxley was, Busk was, and Busk was Schaffhausen's translate, translator for this paper. This paper is of, of huge paleoanthropological interest historically because not only is it a translation of Schaffhausen's paper three years after it was written, but it also provides some of Busk's interpretations of what the Neanderthal fossil was. And it's also interesting that it was uh, translated in 1861, almost certainly as a result of Charles Lyell's visit to the Neanderthal cave the year before, and possibly him having brought over the paper for Busk. So what do we see uh, there? W what were people thinking about the Neanderthal one. Now, there, we can see very clearly what Thomas Henry Huxley thought about the skull. And he actually says there, a little bit of uh, squashing and, and moving around, and we can actually fit it to a known race already. It doesn't have to. It, it's not going to need to be an aberrant uh, specimen. That it's not going to be a new species. And when we look at the people that were involved, so there's Thomas Henry Huxley, there's there's Charles Lyell, there's uh, Bass, Falconer, Bern Bernard Davis, who was a, an anatomist, craniologist, and had, in fact, interestingly, the largest collection of skulls in the world. He had thousands of skulls, including some he thought was convinced were very similar to the Neanderthal skull, and, could, and he thought the Neanderthal skull could be explained as an aberrant form as a result of uh, syntosis, which is a, um, a skeletal disorder. But just to give... Just to give a flavour of <coughs> the period and what people thought, I'm just going to indulge you in a reading of what Huxley thought about the skull. And I'm going, not going to do it from a PDF, I'm going to do it from a first edition, first impression, author's um, presentation copy of uh, Man's Place in Nature. And, and this is what Huxley had to say about the, about the Neanderthal. He said, in no sense then can the Neanderthal bones be regarded as the remains of a human being intermediate between men and apes. At most, they demonstrate the existence of a man whose skull may be said to revert somewhat towards the pithecoid type, that's ape-like type, just as a carrier or a pooter or a tumbler may sometimes put on the plumage of its primitive stock, the Columba livia, that's a, that's a, a pigeon. And indeed... Though truly the most pithecoid of known human skulls, the Neanderthal cranium is by no means so isolated as it appears to be at first, but forms in reality the extreme term of a series leading gradually from it to the highest and best developed of human crania. So people who were paleoanthropologists were looking at this from the point of view of how do you fit it in with what you've got. And although a lot of people hold that during the 1860s, during which period, as, as I hold, as a result of publications such as, for example, uh, Charles Lyell's Antiquity of Man, we had Origin of Species a few years before, we had this one from Huxley, the intellectual landscape for perhaps accepting a new species into a genus Homo was more amenable to hitherto, but there were other factors. Uh, people were still looking at craniology, races, and all sorts of things, so it wasn't an overnight uh, revolution, as it were, let's start naming these, these slightly aberrant fossils to be new species. So 
we've actually got time to go back a few minutes. And why was it that King did this? Why, why did he go ahead? Remember that nobody else did. And there was a lot of backlash from leading paleoanthropologists, uh, specifically Charles Carter Blake and, and a few others, including, as I said, Bernard Davis and uh, William Turner, who said that there was no way that this could, this could be explained as it being a new species. It could be explained within the parameters of what was known. But William King, I would suggest very strongly, was somebody who was um, idiosyncratic and a bit of a maverick. He was a bit of a difficult uh, person. He had, had problems in... He'd been employed in the Hancock Museum in Newcastle. He had lost his position, and in doing that, he removed the entire Permian collection of fossil fish that he then took to Galway. He was uh, given the chair of, of uh, mineralogy and geology. And there he produced all sorts of good work. A lot of people think he wasn't uh, all fay in paleoanthropology, but the, the uh, record shows otherwise. Two years before he named Neanderthal one, he'd written a very comprehensive paper about speciation and looked at um, Darwin's uh, theory and suggested alternatives which although uh, are not necessarily uh, particularly credible, showed that he had an interest and a knowledge of how speciation worked. And also, within that paper, he discussed uh, racial features of, of man and so on. So he knew a bit about anthropology. When you analyze the text in his, um, specifically his second paper in the Journal of Science, a man had obviously done his, his, his research, uh, his work. Now... My, my inclination is to think that he really didn't have that much to lose. So he wasn't a Charles Lyell, he wasn't Busk, who was going to suggest something a bit extraordinary that people were then going to think was uh, something outlandish. He didn't really have much to lose. And I think supporting that is the fact that he didn't really bother that much about the um, criticism he got afterwards in the literature, as I've said from Carter Blake and others, he continued with his fantastic work with brachiopods, mollusks, and so on. But as a result of taking that step that no one else did, he will forever be a seminal person critical in the history of paleoanthropology. Um, so to begin to round up, I've got time, I've still got eight minutes. Um, what would have happened if the Gibraltar skull would have gone to England, if the scientific society in Gibraltar and kept it in a, in a drawer or wherever it was? which I would seriously argue against because the Gibraltar Scientific Society, and I've not had time to cover that here, had all sorts of management uh, protocols in place. It had catalogues. It had a committee that discussed um, uh, uh, all sorts of things related to specimens, how they should be kept, very similar to modern museo uh, museum practice. So it shows that they knew what they were doing as regards museum work. So what would have happened if it had gone to uh, Britain before. I don't think anything particularly different would have happened. We could argue that perhaps because it had a phase, maybe someone might have recognised it to be slightly different, but we're looking at 15 years before the mid-1860s. We're looking at pre-movement forward with the leading people in the fields, like Charles Lyell, Huxley, and, and others, uh, perhaps beginning to think, well, look, you know, are there any issues here that we can extend... Uh, evolutionary and transmutationalist ideas to, i.e. Uh, man, there weren't, in my view. So when we look at um, uh, th these, these are the three seminal texts that I've said, when we look at the Gibraltar skull going to Britain first, I mean, one of the things, that the most important thing, I think, to take from those diagrams, everyone thinks of the Gibraltar skull as it is now at the bottom, but at the top is what the Gibraltar skull looked like when Busk received it in 1864. Now, as soon as Busk got hold of it, obviously following the, the uh, desires of the period, it was uh, critical to remove some of the material, at least so you could see a little bit better. So that's what happened. Uh, some of the original matrix was removed, exposing the facial fe features uh, a, a lot better than, than when it arrived. And in the centre is what it looks like during the um, Bass meeting, the British Association meeting in 1864. Once um, Arthur Keith and others then took the skull in the early 20th century and gave it a much better clean, then it began to look like the one right at the bottom, where at the moment uh, there is no trace left at all of any of the matrix. 
I remember uh, Chris Ringo saying that there were one or two grains of sand, but certainly not enough. And if you look at the one at the top, you may just be able to ascertain that there's a, a, a piece of uh, land snail there, a uh, land snail shell, which in the literature was described as um, helix vermiculata, but which is almost certainly not, because that's an uh, introduced species in Gibraltar, and it wasn't recorded in our fauna until about uh, the mid-20th uh, century. So it's almost certainly Iberus marmoratus, which is a cliff-loving species and would go quite well with it, that skull having been in the talus itself underneath, underneath the, the, the rock. But we don't have the material. So to round up, what, I can, what I'll say is that the Gibraltar one, although not described as a new species and accepted to be a, a Neanderthal strictly in, at the beginning of the 20th century because although um, Hami and Quatrefages in 1882 included it in the Neanderthal series, it would be a, a while before it was definitively uh, included in that series. So, but it has left a legacy. I mean, one of the legacies that we've looked at... Um, well, I've discussed with a few people in the conference, was uh, the finding of Gibraltar too. Why is that part of the legacy? Well, people came to Gibraltar as a result of uh, Gibraltar 1 having been found here, wanting to find more information. And one of the people that came in 1917 and 1919 was Henry Bruel, who was a French, uh, French paleoanthropologist, was a very good friend of uh, Dorothy Garrard, had a little bit of a um, foray in the talus from Forbes Quarry all the way around to the eastern side of, of Gibraltar and found what he thought were Mysterian tools and suggested he found the uh, Devil's Tower cave. I won't call it rock shelter because in, in Garrett's paper and in Brill's paper they both say cave, so uh, I consider it to, to uh, call it a cave. And she then found, uh, they use all sorts of techniques, blasting and so on, as common at the time, found Gibraltar II, which was uh, is the cranium of a uh, five-year-old male, who she, a very religious woman, called uh, Abel. So she, she called that skull Abel. And then after this, I mean, it continues. We have um, continued interest in, in uh, Gibraltar exploration, paleoanthropology, there's the... Um, Hashtag, the Neanderthal hashtag, found in Gorham's Cave, 2012, and the child upper right canine, canine milk tooth from Vanguard Cave, which is uh, under study at the moment, and, and maybe a an, an Neanderthal tooth. And then excavations, as we all know, continue on a yearly basis. And I would argue that, uh, as many others, that... Uh, the World Heritage Site is as a result of initially Arthur Gorham in, in uh, 1907 uh, discovering Gorham's Cave, but also as a result of all the work since then. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a tradition of paleoanthropology in Gibraltar. And just to, to close, we've seen that already. Um, Mauricio showed that. Very interesting, historically, first appeared... It was drawn by the Czech artist Franz Tranistek Kupta, as Mauricio said, but it first appeared not in the Illustrated London News, but in the French uh, L'Illustration on the 20th of February, appearing on the 20th of February 1909. The following week, on the 27th of February, it appeared in the Illustrated London News. And interestingly, from the point of view of historical um, content, is that although... A lot of people have said that uh, Bull, Marcelin Bull, did have an, obviously an input into its description and so on and reconstruction. Very carefully in the French one, if you look at the French legend of the uh, picture, the author, Honoré, actually says that Bull looked and helped with the reconstruction of the environment. He doesn't actually say the reconstruction of the actual Neanderthal itself and... If you read the, the legend, it's, the, it's the, the artist saying that he reconstructed it from anatomy, so on and so forth. So that's, that's why it's, it's interesting historically. We need to look at that a bit more. And 
we've seen that one a few times. That's 1930s Field Museum um, display of Neanderthal, a Neanderthal woman with a child, and a much happier, uh, <laughs> a much happier Gibraltar one and Gibraltar two. Who have, these have lived in the museum for the last few years. They were reconstructed, uh, reconstruction by um, the Kennis, Kennis twins, Adri and Alphonse. And just to finish, um, although we don't, we don't have any definitive, any definitive contemporaneous evidence of exactly when the skull was found, we know that it was found, obviously, before 1848. How do we know that that skull is the one that's in the minute book and so on. Well, we know that because there's continuity in, in, the, in the literature. I, I don't mean the published literature. I mean in the um, archival literature that Flint and Broom, who were contemporaneous in the scientific society, both were involved with the skull. Broom was the one who showed Hodgkin the skull he didn't say that Flint had found it, which is one of the reasons that I, I'm pretty certain that he didn't. He was probably given the skull and, and he um, presented it to the society. But we can be pretty certain uh, that it was around about that time because um, it's, it's possibly true that the, the, the last person who probably had knowledge of the skull who's rec uh, recorded in any literature, and this is in a letter from William Turner, who I described initially was from Gibraltar and looking at Forbes Quarry and saw the cave, he wrote to, to uh, Arthur Keith and said that, uh, I'll read from the letter, he said, Today I drove round the rock to Catalan Bay on the eastern side to interview an old woman of 84 who was said to know something about the finding of the skull. But I found the old lady almost in a dotage, which means that she, she was no longer um, uh, uh, mentally completely 100%, and could not get reliable facts from her. Now, what I've uh, written elsewhere is that that lady was uh, 22 years old in 1848 and 38 during Busk and Falconer's visit in 1864. So had that lady been known to Busk and Falconer, we may today have a much more detailed history of the Gibraltar skull. So I've run over a little bit, but that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.